The wind fish slumbers long. The hero's life is gone. This is Legendary Adventures Podcast. This week in Link's Awakening, it's time to face the facts about the nature of Koholint Island. After getting the instrument in Catfish's Maw, Link is directed to find an island secret in the shrine. There are actually two shrines, and both are north of Animal Village. But before heading there, I took some time to round up a few things. (laughs) On the southern end of Martha's Bay, there's a staircase surrounded by bushes and holes. It leads to a cave just north of the ghost's house. Here we can find the Mad Batter for a second time. Players can choose to be cursed with the ability to carry more magic or more arrows. This time, I got cursed with the ability to hold more magic powder. I skipped this visit on my second and third playthroughs of the game while preparing for this podcast. The Mad Batter upgrades are nice, but ultimately optional. I also took time on my initial playthrough to visit the Seashell Mansion and cash in 20 seashells. After cashing in the shells, Link is given an upgraded sword. It deals more damage and will fire beams when Link's health is full in a callback to the original game. Once the sword is acquired in the Game Boy versions of the game, the remaining secret seashells hidden around the world will be replaced by rupees. In my second and third playthroughs of the game for this podcast, I did not upgrade my sword. Now it's time to head to the shrine as we approach the Owl Appears. It directs Link to head first to a shrine in the south. The Owl says Link will learn much in the ancient ruins. The ruins to the south are a maze of pillars and Armos statues. As with the original game, Link can awaken the statues with a touch. In this game, the statues fall to a single shot from the bow and will always reward an arrow in return. The southern face shrine is on the west side of the ruins. When players enter, they will be greeted by an ominous rendition of the Ballad of the Windfish. Players will also come face to face with a boss, an Armos Knight. Players can deal damage by jumping with Rock's Feather and hitting it with a spin attack. Damage can also be dealt with the bow, but I used the spin attack for the entire fight. The knight moves towards Link and then performs a ground-shaking attack. A well-timed jump will keep Link from getting stunned. After a few hits, the knight's shield breaks and it turns red. A few more hits will cause its helmet to break, revealing a black void with a pair of eyes where the head should be. Once the knight falls, it drops a key to the northern face shrine, and Link is able to move deeper into this shrine. After lighting a pair of torches, players can read a carving on the wall. It states Koholint Island and its inhabitants are all just the dream of the windfish. If the windfish is awakened, it will vanish. Outside the shrine, Link is greeted by the owl. It casts some doubt on the carving. The owl says the truth can't be known for sure until the windfish is awakened, comparing it to a treasure chest where the contents can't be known until it's opened. The face shrine dungeon is located to the north of the southern shrine. Players have to swim to it. A small island in the river holds two armos. Touching the one on the left reveals a staircase to a cave. On the other side, players arrive at the entrance to the face shrine. With the key, the entrance rises up, allowing players to enter. True to its name, face shrine is a dungeon that is indeed shaped like a face, or more specifically, it's more like a head wearing a three-pointed crown. Unmarked rooms form the eyes and mouth. The dungeon is divided into two segments but the segments aren't clearly marked in the same way that we saw in A Link to the Past. If players first head east in the dungeon, they'll run into a locked door forcing them back west. There's nothing forcing players to clear out the entire west side before traveling east, but I find the game generally keeps players exploring the west side until they have the dungeon item, and once they do, there will be no barriers facing them on the east side. The music of Face Shrine has a low, ominous energy to it. It also does not have the deep bass notes seen in other themes, but the rising and falling melody creates a light sense of unease. The Switch version adds strings to the mix, giving it a much more dramatic and almost mournful quality. As players travel through the face shrine, there are large elephant statues scattered around the dungeon, and some block the path forward. The dungeon item, an upgraded power bracelet, allows players to lift the statues once acquired. It's also worth noting this dungeon introduces the Wizrobe enemies in the game. It's the sixth dungeon of Link's Awakening. Wizrobes were also introduced in the sixth dungeon of the original game and A Link to the Past. Only Zelda 2 breaks the tradition by introducing Wizrobes in the fifth dungeon. 
In this game, the wish ropes also disappear and reappear in the same spot, and they are most easily defeated by placing a bomb on their location the moment after they disappear. Arrows can also be used, but it will take three arrows to defeat a wish rope. The dungeon map has found a room just west of the dungeon's left eye. Players will have to press a floor switch to enter the room. Defeating three wiz ropes reveals a chest with the map. The stone beak has found one room north and one room east of the map room. The compass is in a room directly north of the stone beak room. As mentioned, the eyes of the dungeon are created by unmarked rooms. There are in reality rooms in both eyes. Players will have to use bombs to reveal them. It's a callback to the first game which pulled this trick often. In the room immediately east of the map room, players may notice a path leads straight into the wall between two torches. It's a hint to the location of the bombable wall. Players can hit the wall with the sword to confirm. Bombable walls sound different. This feature was also present in A Link to the Past, but it gets much more use in Link's Awakening. In the Switch remake, this wall, and most other bombable walls, are clearly marked with cracks. Inside the unmarked rooms, players can defeat the slime enemies to reveal a staircase. It leads to a side-scrolling area which connects to the southwestern corner of the dungeon. In this corner, players will find the upgraded power bracelet. With the ability to now lift and throw elephant statues, players can gain access to a room with a chest in the northwestern point of the crown. It contains rupees. It also has a set of stairs which lead to the overworld. Players will exit into a small island with a chest in the middle of the rapid ride. The chest either contains a secret seashell or rupees. This room and others in the face shrine also contain a pair of knight chess pieces. Players need to pick them up and throw them. If both land standing up, the door will open. In the original game, it was random if the knight pieces would land the proper way. The Switch remake greatly improves on this by making the pieces move like actual knights on a chessboard. Players need to make them land on specific spaces using that L-shaped movement. Players now need to head to the east side of the dungeon. The goal here is to collect the nightmare key and reach the boss. On at least two of my playthroughs, I took a route through the dungeon that required me to backtrack extensively to get the Nightmare Key. The best way to move through this segment starts in the room just east of the mouth of the dungeon. Players pick up an elephant statue and throw it at a door to travel east one room, and then north three rooms. They'll find a chest with a small key. Then it's on to the Nightmare Key. Backtracking to the room east of the mouth, players will then move north to the right eye of the dungeon. It too is an unmarked room, which players need to bomb their way into. This time there is no hint on where the bomb should be placed. Players must hit the wall with the sword to find the right spot, or, you know, just look for the cracks on the wall in the Switch remake. The bombed entrance leads to the mini-boss of the dungeon. It's a Stingray-type enemy which picks up and hurls a large metal ball at Link. Players need to use the power bracelet to pick up the ball and hurl it back at the boss. Once the boss falls, we continue north. The next room has an open door to the north, but this door just loops players back south to the mini-boss room. It's sort of like the Lost Woods or the Lost Hills of the original game, except there's no solution here to figure out. This is just the developers messing with you. Instead of looping over and over again, players instead need to lift an elephant statue to reveal a set of stairs. Players will pass through multiple side-scrolling segments and face another knight chess piece puzzle as they loop around to a room at the base of the crown on the east side. In this room, players will have a rematch against the Dodongo Snakes. The idea of repeated bosses is alive and well here in Link's Awakening. We've seen it in all Zelda games to this point, and repeated bosses will continue throughout the series all the way through Tears of the Kingdom. After defeating the Dodongos, players can head east and hookshot across a gap before heading north to claim the Nightmare Key. It's in a chest surrounded by jars, but it does not open when players hit the action button. A helpful owl statue will give players the solution if they need it. This chest, just like some doors, needs to be hit with a jar in order to open. With the Nightmare Key, we backtrack to the looping room and again lift the elephant statue to go downstairs. On the other side of the stairs, we head south, east, and then north to reach the Nightmare Door. The boss of the dungeon is Facade, a giant face which emerges from the floor. When first appearing, Facade starts to give players a hint to its weakness. Even though it stops short of doing so, it may have already revealed too much. Players have to place bombs on the floor when the face appears to damage it. As the fight begins, floor tiles begin to fly at Link. Once those are all gone, jars in the corner will fly at Link. Players can move quickly to destroy the jars to avoid those as the fight begins. In the Switch remake, the tiles and jars can actually push the bombs that Link places, moving them away from facade and preventing damage. Once all the objects in the boss room are gone, holes begin to open and close in the floor. 
In my playthrough of the Game Boy versions of the game, the sod seemed to remain in the center of the room at all times. In the Switch remake, it moves around the room. After enough hits with the bombs, Facade falls. It tells Link that the island of Koholint is all but a dream, and that if the Windfish awakes, the island and all of its inhabitants will disappear forever, implying that Link too will also disappear. After taking the awarded heart container, Link can move north to acquire the sixth instrument of the Sirens, the Coral Triangle. After getting the instrument, a voice tells Link to head to the mountains. That's where we'll head next week. If you want to follow along and you haven't already, please subscribe. If you know someone who would enjoy this podcast, please recommend it to them. I'm Paul Riley. Thanks for listening.